A very warm welcome to the second and final day of the launch of the book Conceptualizing Mass Violence, Representations, Recollections, and Reinterpretations. I'm Navra Safridi, one of the two editors of the volume, and we are privileged to have with us several of the contributors to the book. Before we commence today's program, I would like to invite Dr. Sylvia Schmelkes, the academic provost of Ibero Americana University, Mexico City, to say the opening words. Professor Schmelkes, please. Thank you very much, Navras. And it is a pleasure for me to welcome you to Universidad Iberoamericana for this very important launch in which the book Conceptualizing Mass Violence representations, recollections, and reinterpretations is being presented. This is a sad time for our university due to the passing of our president last Thursday. But carrying out our academic activities and such pertinent ones such as the one we are having today is a way of paying homage to his dedication to the enhancement of the mission of our university, which states that we strive towards a more just, solidarious, free, inclusive, and peaceful society. Mexico is a country in which, unfortunately, violence, violence is endemic. It manifests itself in multiple forms, organized crime, domestic violence, ecocide with its, application, its implications on the violent loss of human lives, state violence against migrants that come from Central America wanting to reach the United States, and also against our own internal migrants, not to speak of structural violence that explains great inequalities and 56 million living in poverty in our country, or of symbolic violence and racism against our own indigenous population. Mass violence forms part of our recent history. In the last 50 years, too many episodes hurt our collective memory. What we call the dirty war against the guerrillas in the state of Guerrero in the 1970s, the massacre of Actiel in Chiapas in 1997, the assassination of 27 migrants from Central America in San Fernando, Tamaulipas in 2010, the disappearance of 43 normal school students in 2014, and unfortunately, the list is longer. The role university of, of universities is key in forming students to understand the causes and obtaining the ethical and the technical competences for combating these realities. The generation of knowledge about these problems hopefully with the collaboration of those who suffer them is key. The discussion and dissemination of these unacceptable phenomena that we are, what we are doing today is needed to create consciousness and to influence policy. I greet our illustrious speakers. I want to express my thanks on behalf of the university and to tell you that we are very, very honored to have you here today. I especially want to thank Yael Seaman, a professor in Iberoamericana University an author of one of the case studies in the book. I also welcome all of you who are participating in this virtual presentation. I tell you all, esta es su casa. Please feel at home. I'm sure this will be a very interesting and fruitful launch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Schmelkes. Now, before we proceed ahead with our program for today, I would like to take a few minutes to give you an overview of our book for those of us who haven't been able to join yesterday, but have joined only today. We had eight of our contributors speak on the first day of the launch. Today, we'll have several other contributors speak about their chapters, but in this overview, you will get an idea of the chapters contributed by also by those contributors who would not be speaking today. So just give me a minute to share my screen with you. So there are 22 scholars from Austria, Australia, Chile, India, Israel, Mexico, South Africa, and the USA who have contributed 19 chapters to the volume that cover all inhabited continents 
and they, it has been done with the intention to explore and deliberate upon the varied aspects of mass violence from the 20th century to the present, namely atrocities, memorialization and literature, reconstruction, revisionism, the criticality of dialogue and reconciliation, the need for Holocaust education and trauma. The volume is divided into eight parts, which are narratives, revisionism and reconstruction, education, reflections, trauma, memorialization, literature, dialogue, and reconciliation. The opening chapter of the volume is the one that gives an introduction to it. It's been authored by me and my co-editor Priya Singh, a political scientist. I'm an historian. The first section is devoted to narratives, which has a chapter by Professor Dennis B. Klein titled Violence and Violations, Betrayal Narratives in Atrocity Accounts. The second chapter in the section is by Daniela Gleiser and Yael Seaman. It is titled Holocaust Survivors in Mexico Intersecting and conflicting narratives of open doors, welcoming society and personal hardships. The third chapter in the section is by Ruben Firestone titled, Historical Narratives, the Perpetuation of Trauma and the Work of Vamik Vulcan. The second section is devoted to revisionism and reconstruction. It has a chapter by Charles Ehrlich, titled Holocaust Propaganda and the Distortion of History in the Former Soviet Space. The second chapter in the section is titled The Genocide of 1971 in Bangladesh, Lessons from History by Srimanti Sarkar. The third chapter is by Muhammad Mudassir Kamar, titled Holocaust, Denial and Minimization in the Indian Urdu Press. The next section is devoted to education, which has a chapter by Suzanne Rutland and Suzanne Hampel, titled Holocaust Studies in Australia, Moving from Family and Community Remembrance to Human Rights and Prevention of Mass Violence. The next chapter in the section is by Tali Nates, titled New Developments in Holocaust and Genocide Education in South Africa, the case study of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. The then yet another chapter in the section is titled The Case of Naive Normalization, India's Misbeliefs About Hitler and Schooling on the Holocaust by Anubhav Roy. And the last chapter in the section has been written by me, it's titled Holocaust Education in India and Its Challenges. I shall be speaking about this chapter of mine in a little while from now. The next section of the book is devoted to reflections, which has a chapter titled Sundar Commando, Photo 4 and the Portrayal of the Invisible by David Patterson. Then another chapter, Overcoming Intimate Hatreds, Reflections on Violence Against Yazidis by Goons Murat Pesker and Tutko Ehan. And a chapter by Anita Singh Gupta titled The State and Its Margins, Changing Notions of Marginality in Turkey. Then we have a section devoted to trauma, which has a paper by Nancy Nichols Lopeandia titled Pinochet's Dictatorship and Reflections on Trauma in Chile. How much have we learned in terms of human rights? Then we have a section devoted to memorialization, which has a couple of chapters. The first chapter is by Stephanie Shosh Rotem. Uh, her chapter is titled Grassroots Holocaust Museums revealing the untold stories. And the other chapter in the section is titled Fabric, Food, Song, The Quiet Continuities in Bengali Life 70 Years After Partition by Ritu Parna Roy. Then the second last chapter, the second last section of the book is devoted to literature, which has a chapter by Fuzel Asar Sadiqi titled The Failure of Secular Publics and the Rise of the Jewish Religious Public in Nathan Englander's for the relief of unbearable urges. And the last section of the volume is titled Dialogue and Reconciliation, which has a chapter by David Rosen titled The 2002 Alexandria Summit 
and its follow up. Thank you. Now, moving ahead, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nancy Nichols Lopiandia, who is a lecturer of history at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, to speak about her chapter. Professor Lopiandia, please. Could you please unmute yourself? I'm so sorry. You hear me now? Okay. So thank you very much uh, to Navras uh, and Yael for organizing this event. Well, my article uh, argues that in the post-dictatorship period, Chilean society has engaged in a process of reflection or elaboration of the trauma produced by the coercive policies of Pinochet dictatorship that ruled the country between 1973 and 1990. This process has implied the consensual recognition of the veracity of the violation to human rights committed by Pinochet regime and a condemnation of them. However, the Chilean state, I am talking in the post dictatorship period, has failed to incorporate the traumatic memory of the repression and its devastating effects on citizens as a means of societal learning for a more democratic coexistence and a deepening of democracy. <clears throat> and it was evident in the sustained violation of human rights committed by police officers and the military in the context of the social uprising that Chile experiences between the middle of October 1917 and March 2020. The detonator of the explosion was the rise of the cost of public transport that led young high school students to out, act, act out their indignation and to take part in massive escapes in the Santiago underground but the real motivation of the uprising was to protest against the neoliberal model that was established during dictatorship. From then on, the movement spread out massively. In the most convening moment of the street protest on October 25th, uh, 2019 in Santiago, the epicenter of the events, 1,200,000 people demonstrated. It was a mobilization that combined peaceful strategies with form of manifestation of unusual violence. Both the police and the army forces deploy indiscriminate violence toward the civilian population without distinguishing between peaceful and violent demonstrations. One of the most um, dramatic consequences of the repression were the eye traumas, some of them with total or partial loss of vision that 359 people suffered due the, to the action of the special forces and their use of rubber ballets in the context of the mobilization. To this must be added the reports of sexual assaults in the police prisons where detained demonstrators were taken. In a historical perspective, it is surprising and worrying that a country that went through a prolonged military dictatorship and was a protagonist of a systematic policy of human rights violation, violation, sorry, and therefore experiences extreme social trauma, is once again the a scene of serious human rights violation. So the question is, what has gone wrong? It is clear. Uh, from my point of view, that is not enough to know the historical facts or to keep the memory of what happens alive to ensure that the state and society respect human rights. Incorporating them as values that guide individual conduct, but are also public policies and the practices of the institution that sustain democracy requires profound changes that involve broad human rights education. On the other hand, a society whose political institutions have not been able to carry out a successful transitional justice process is not contributing to making human rights a priority on its political agenda. The unsolved notes of the recent past continued, therefore, in the following decades, reappearing and expressing conflicts, tensions, and traumas of the dictatorial period, dressed in new clothes and revitalized with new actors. Thus, for example, can the repudiation and hostility of large sectors of civil society towards the force of the police and the army be explained only by their violation of human rights today? 
or is it also nourished by the memory and impunity of their crimes under the dictatorship? It is key for today, Chile, and I finish with this, to revisit the past, but not as a mere formal and rhetorical exercise, but rather to ask ourselves what elements of the past have been perpetuated, causing division and gaps among Chileans, what lessons we can learn from the conflict we have lived through, and what uses we can give to memory in order in order to guarantee non-repetition. Without this critical exercise, we run the risk of failing again and again to respect, respect human rights, deepening the traumatic wound we carry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopigandia. Now moving on, I would like to invite Dr. Tutu Ehan, postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention, Binghamton University, to give us an overview of her chapter on the violence against Yazidis. Dr. Ehan, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank our editors, Navras and Priya, and El Sayal, and colleagues at Ibero-Americana University for organizing, hosting, and moderating this book lunch. I also would like to thank all other contributors to this edited volume, which itself is an important contribution to the field of mass atrocity and prevention. Um, today, I'll be talking about the chapter I co-authored with Gunesh Mnatesjur from University of Central Florida. Uh, our chapter is mainly a historical reflection on the violence against the Yazidi, the religious minority from Northern Iraq, which was subjected to genocide by the so-called Islamic State in August 2014 in Sinjar region. It is based on a survey of secondary literature about Yazidi political history, original documents in primary languages, including Kurdish and Turkish, and more than 100 in-depth interviews conducted in Duhok province in Iraqi Kurdistan in 2018 and 19, uh, where the majority of displaced Yazidi lived. Uh, we conducted interviews with displaced Yazidis living in the camps, but also non-displaced Yazidis and activists, uh, religious leaders, politicians, and professionals working on the Yazidi case. While many other groups, including Christians, uh, Shiite Arabs and Turkmens, as well as Sunni Arabs and Kurds were also targets of the IS, the violence against Yazidis was exceptional given its intensity and repertoire. Our main question in the chapter is, why did the IS target Yazidis so viciously? And we tried to address this question by adopting a historical perspective and comparing the IS campaign with previous episodes of anti-Yazidi violence. We analyzed intercommunal relations and violence against Yazidis under the Ottomans, under the Iraqi state in the post-2003 order, as well as during the August 2014 attacks. Our main argument is that several previous campaigns targeting Yazidis before the 20th century, just like the genocidal campaign of the IS, involved practices of mass killing and enslavement, which were justified on religious grounds. Yet in those campaigns, um, geopolitical goals and religious motives were more intertwined. Most campaigns taken by Ottoman rulers against Yazidis on Mount Sinjar were motivated by matters of governance aims, such as securing major transportation and communication routes, collecting taxes and conscripting recruits. Also, Yazidis were not simply passive victims, but they actually engaged in various political alliances with non-Yazidi forces throughout history. There is also a long pattern of repeated interactions between Yazidi and their Muslim neighbors. At the same time, uh, we also show that religious prejudice and bias played a necessary role in fomenting anti-Yazidi violence and providing justifications for practices that would not have been possible in the absence of such justifications, especially regarding the enslavement of women and children. Furthermore, the absence of any notable Islamic discourse until at least very recently that explicitly challenged and refuted widespread pejorative views of Yazidis left the community particularly vulnerable to campaigns inspired by religious hatred. On the other hand, the IS violence against Yazidis compared to previous campaigns has unique characteristics as it was exclusively justified on religious grounds. 
There were no strong non-religious reasons for the IS to engage in mass killing and enslavement of Yazidis, who presented no threat to the growing power of Saladi jihadists by the summer of 2014. To emphasize this point once again, Yazidis have obviously been subjected to high levels of violence and repression, but as scholars, it is also a responsibility to acknowledge the agency of Yazidis, especially in terms of intercommunal relations, in terms of their interaction with other ethnic groups and political leaders, it's very important to be able to go beyond the concept of victimhood. We conclude the chapter by stating uh, the paradoxical consequence of the genocide, which may be first time in the history of Yazidis, brought about the politics of recognition. This was the first time Yazidis became actors on the global stage where um, they received recognition. The genocide is ongoing, displacement and challenges ahead for a dignified and secure return to their homeland in Sinjar, as well as mass immigration uh, poses considerable risks for the survival and practice uh, of them as a community, but also of their religious identity. Uh, but to end on a more optimistic note, this is also a time when international community hears about the Yazidis and when the national actors recognize them as they are, um, so it's a critical time for the community to not only ask uh, for help and support, but to increase their political agency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ehan. Moving on, I would like to request Dr. Daniel Aglaiser, Associate Researcher in History at National Autonomous University of Mexico, and Dr. Yael Siman, Associate Professor of Social and Political Sciences at Iberoamericana University, Mexico City, and also the convener of this book launch event to kindly give us an overview of their chapter focused on Holocaust survivors in Mexico. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to be here. And first of all, I'd like to thank Navras and Priya for the invitation to participate in the book, and Yael for organizing this transnational presentation. Thank you also to the uh, Universidad Iberoamericana. And hello, Silvia, very, I'm very glad that you could join us. And I'm very sorry I had to stand up and, and my computer was, the, the internet was very weak and I had to move. Well, I'm going to, to share the screen and just one second. Okay. Is, is it okay? It looks good. Ya él se ve bien. Perdón, se ve perfecto, sí. Okay, perfect. So our chapter is entitled Holocaust Survivors in Mexico, Intersecting and Conflicting Narratives of Open Doors, Welcoming Society and Personal Hardships. And the intention of this chapter is, is to make a contribution to our knowledge of the transnational histories of the Holocaust by focusing on Mexico and the Jewish refugees who immigrated to this country as the main case study. Although there are many memoirs and literary works, the experiences of Holocaust, I'm sorry, but I have to move this. Also, there are many memoirs and literary works. The experiences of Holocaust survivors remain largely understudied, particularly in Latin America. So I have to say that Latin America is important for this story because uh, it was not a marginal site of refuge during Nazism or even in the post-war period. It is estimated that between 1933 and 1943, close to 90,000 Jewish refugees immigrated to Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is a photo of the port of Buenos Aires, also it's a little early, it's not in, in, in the 30s, it's a little early. Okay, so uh, this is a, a, a small estimated numbers, uh, a very, very broad uh, picture of how many refugees, how many Jewish refugees receive each country. As you can see, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile were the countries that uh, allowed the, the most uh, the most refugees to 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 arrive that um, well I'm sorry about my English 
<laughs> but the contribution of Mexico is, uh, is not very important. Mexico received only 1,800 refugees between 1,800 and 2,000. For a country of the size of Mexico and the economy of Mexico, it's a very, very small contribution. And um, in total, as I said, Latin America received near to 90,000 refugees. So there were some restrictions on Jews, uh, and this is uh, a way to explain wh why Mexico received so many, uh, so a small amount of refugees. And in contrast to other exiled groups as, such as Spanish Republicans, Mexico had a highly restrictive and selective policy toward Jewish refugees. This policy resulted from the government's intention to protect national workers, I mean, an economic reason, but also from the goal of preserve the racial homogeneity of the population, even if this resulted from miscegenation or mestizaje. I mean, the, it, the Mexican population was a result of the mestizaje, the mixing of the Spaniards and the indigenous people from Mexico. And they thought this, this was a mix. They didn't defend the purity of the race, but they thought that the, this particular mix of population needed to be protected from external influences and from influences of other cultures. So Jews were regarded as one of the most undesirable foreign groups and Jewish immigration, in fact, was forbidden since 1934 in Mexico. So this was very, had a very, very big impact in the policy that Mexico uh, followed to Jewish um, migration. Even though this uh, restrictive immigration policy toward Jews during the Holocaust, there was a dominant narrative of Mexico as a country of open doors, which emerged and consolidated during this period, even within the Jewish community. Our chapter explores then how this narrative took shape and why it endured for so long, even while the testimonies of Jewish refugees tell a very different and far more complex story. And now I give the floor to Yael. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela. I need your help. With the yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so, uh, so what do survivors say in their testimonies? So on the one hand, they talk about uh, having long waits to obtain their visas in Europe. They also speak about uh, facing a cultural shock upon arrival to Mexico. They faced uh, various difficulties, including uh, getting work permits and becoming citizens. They also uh, silenced their, their stories, either because they chose to do so, not to hurt their uh, relatives, or because the community or the society did not want to listen to them. They also had uneasy and uncom uncomfortable family receptions, even if at first uh, uh, if, if initially they were warm and, and happy, they turn out to be frequently uneasy and uncomfortable, although not always. But at the same time, it, it, it is interesting if, if we listen carefully to their testimonies that they shared a sense of gratitude to Mexico, that they regarded Mexico as a safe place, as a place of refuge, and they also saw Mexico as a place of liberty and progress. So among our findings, we have the following. On the one hand, that incorporating survivors' testimonies in the historiography of Jewish immigration to Mexico during Nazism, and also in the post-war years, allows us to have a deeper and more complex understanding of the process of migration, arrival, and adaptation. Also that the survivors' testimonies narrate a far more complex story than the one told by the dominant narrative, which is a romanticized and idealized um, description or depiction of immigration and arrival. And thirdly, that the mosaic of diverse experiences reveals a complex history of both welcoming encounters and solidarity but also rejection and hardship. And it's very interesting to read about the descriptions of the landscapes of Mexico and uh, the, the contrast between the Mexican culture and the European culture. Thank you, Daniela. The, the next one, I think it's, yeah. So to end our presentation, we, we wanna share with you some of the rethinking that we've been doing and we hope the chapter promotes among our readers regarding the national narratives on the Holocaust and forced migration. On the one hand, we think 
that we should rethink the methodological challenges, uh, including the need to incorporate the survivors' testimonies in the historiography of Jewish immigration to Mexico, as we said before, during Nazism and also in the post-war years. And also that we need to incorporate the voices of those who were not accepted in the country and not only those who were accepted to the country, because there are plenty of stories like those. And in fact, that's demonstrated by the hard data that uh, Daniela showed earlier regarding the small number of refugees who were able to uh, enter Mexico during that historical period. And maybe you know, if we found those stories, maybe we could, uh, we could reconstruct this history in an even far more complex way. And for further discussion, we would like to share the, the following question. And we think that it's a question that not only applies to Mexico, but, but that invites a conversation with other communities and other uh, scholars who are uh, working on uh, issues of vi mass violence and forced migration in different geographies. And it is uh, as follows. To what extent a critical revision of national narratives, in this case, the Mexican one, towards refugees, contributes to making more visible particular restrictive immigration practices and policies that are still in place today. And Daniela and I were uh, discussing how, um, how the past can then inform uh, the present in terms of uh, maybe promoting a more profound reflection, seeking the truth and informing more uh, compassionate and humane uh, immigration policies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gleiser and Dr. Seaman. Now, before we move on, I would like to tell our listeners that they are most welcome to post their questions in the Q&A section, in the Q&A box. So please, you are invited to do so. And uh, now our next speaker for today is Ms. Suzanne Hampel, who is currently the international chair of Education Working Group, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and co-president of the Jewish Holocaust Center in Melbourne, Ms. Hampel. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. And I'll just go, I'll just go back. To, uh, just went to the back. Oh, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Navras and Yael, for organising this book launch. And I'm honoured to be speaking to you from Australia. And I acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live. I'm speaking on behalf of my co-author, Dr. Suzanne Rutland. So the 20th century has been recognised as a century of genocide. From the tragedy of the Armenians during World War I into the 21st century, millions of people, men, women and children, have been murdered in the name of racial, religious or tribal purity. This included six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust. Our chapter, Holocaust Studies in Australia, moving from family and community remembrance to human rights education, focuses on Australia, where about 35,000 Jewish refugees and Holocaust survivors found a safe haven before and after the war. Most embraced their new homeland, but re were reluctant to talk about their experiences. They wanted to concentrate on rebuilding their lives. Today, the Australian Jewish community is a vibrant community of up to 120,000 people, concentrated mainly in Melbourne and Sydney. We argue that Holocaust memory at first remained largely within the survivor community, such as the annual ball of the Buchenwald boys, my father was one of the Buchenwald boys, who were liberated on the 11th of April, 1945. There were also annual Warsaw Ghetto commemorations. It was only with the opening of Holocaust museums in Melbourne in 1984 and Sydney in 1992 that the concept of offering Holocaust education to the public emerged. Since this book was published just earlier this year, the Australian government has actually announced funding for new Holocaust museums in all capital cities, Perth, Adelaide, Canberra, Hobart and Brisbane, ensuring there will be a Holocaust museum in every state and territory. For most survivors, the 19, in the 90, early 1980s, they opposed talking about it or using it as an example for a broader narrative. In this period, it was mainly personal stories and the specific, specificity of the Jewish experience, 
but we have been seeing a generational change with a move from the particular to include the universal message of human rights and the prevention of mass violence, described by Yehuda Bauer as in rethinking the Holocaust. So then they started to speak to different groups. In 2016, the Sydney Jewish Museum began a major renovation of its Holocaust exhibition with the experience of other persecuted groups, including homosexuals, gypsies, and the disabled. As well, the final top level has this human rights section focusing on other genocides, including Australia's First Nations, so that the universal aspect of the survivor's legacy once was focused on the personal, the private and Jewish has been now firmly established. We have argued that since Australia became a member of the IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, it illustrates new approaches and the central role that Holocaust education can play in combating prejudice. As well, Holocaust education is very important in Australia, as seen with the introduction into various state history curricula. This has recently been mandated in the state of Victoria last year in response to worrying exposure of problems of anti-Semitism in government schools. While there are a number of university Holocaust programs, they, these are not mandatory for history teachers. This gap in knowledge creates a challenge of the need to introduce more professional development for history teachers who choose to focus on teaching the Holocaust and its concomitant universal message. As well, there is a challenge of involving groups for whom the Holocaust has less relevance, such as Muslim school children, as demonstrated by recent research. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Hampel. Now, with everyone's permission, I would like to present an overview of the chapter that I have contributed to our volume. Can you all? My chapter is titled Holocaust Education in India and its Challenges. A big challenge that Holocaust education faces in India is this delusion that uh, Holocaust remembrance and its studies have no relevance for the country. People don't realize that India needs mass violence studies badly because no democracy without being in a state of war, neither interstate nor civil has experienced mob violence of the scale and at the frequency that India has. The reoccurring low intensity cyclic riots have become a structural feature of Indian society. Holocaust is an ideal case study for mass violence studies for Indians because of the distance it provides them, which enables them to draw lessons from it without losing their objectivity, which may not be the case with an episode of mass violence closer home. Holocaust stands out among all genocides because of its scale and magnitude. Yet in spite of this, this realization hasn't descended on India and India refuses to be a member of Holocaust remembrance organizations such as International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. There is absolute absence, almost absolute absence of Holocaust education in India. Most tertiary level institutions are funded fully or partially by the state, which has a dismal record of mass violence prevention and conviction of the guilty. Hence, it's only natural for it to be reluctant to introduce mass violence studies, lest it draws attention to the above mentioned. There are a few other challenges. 
there is Holocaust denial, its minimization and or trivialization of the Holocaust in certain sections of Indian society. Uh, and in addition to that, there is also widespread ignorance of the Holocaust. The reason behind this ignorance uh, also has to do with how India was largely indifferent to the Jewish problem and was prim primarily concerned with the perceived plight of the Arabs in mandate Palestine. This also has to do with the fact that the Zionists had reservations in expressing their support for India when it was struggling for its independence from the British, while the Arab nationalists had no such reservations. The Zionists refrained from doing that because they were hopeful that they would be able to draw concessions from the British to get more Jewish refugees into Mandate Palestine. However, there have been a few developments, and one major development has been that Presidency University Kolkata, the institution that I serve, launched a Holocaust-focused course under the auspices of its MA history program in 2016. There is still much that needs to be done. We badly need translation of Holocaust educational literature in India's major languages. We need to train secondary level teachers for teaching about the Holocaust. We need to introduce Holocaust studies at the secondary and tertiary levels of education, and we must broadcast Holocaust cinema dubbed in all of India's major 22 languages on the national television and also via satellite television. Thank you. Navras, I'm, are... sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think I can give the possibility to Professor David Patterson and also Professor Dennis Klein to speak, okay. even if they do it from the attendees uh, se section. So let me try to do that. That would so, be lovely. We can get them. So uh, Professor uh, Patterson, I will try to give you uh, now the possibility to speak. I think you're able to speak now. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, am I able to share a screen or not? I'm not sure about that. Let me check. But okay. uh, unless okay. you want to send me your presentation uh, now. And um, I do that. Well, uh, it's I'll try without the screen, although my presentation is about photographs. Yes. So, uh, yes, <laughs> let me try the problem. Yes, let me try but I'm not sure, one second. I promoted you to panelist. So <laughs> now you, you may be able to share your screen. Okay, here I am. Yes, excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. You're a genius. Welcome, welcome Professor Patterson. So nice to have you here with us. Professor David Patterson. Professor David Patterson is the Hillel A. Feinberg Distinguished Chair in Holocaust Studies at the University of Texas at Dallas. And he will be speaking to us about his chapter, Sundar Commando, Photo 4, and the Portrayal of the Invisible. Professor Patterson. Thank you, and my apologies for my incompetence in uh, joining this esteemed company. Um, my chapter in this very important book um, and that I'm honored to be part of is on the fourth photograph uh, known in a, in a series known as the Zonder Commando photos. Um, the, the fourth photograph is almost always omitted. In fact, Yehuda Bauer in his history book says, uh, you know, the Zona Commando smuggled three photographs out. Uh, the, the fourth photograph is ignored, and when the three are shown, they're almost always cropped with the black frame cut out of it. Of course, the black frame, as you see in this photograph, is the frame that's there as the photographer takes the picture from inside a gas chamber, okay? Um, 
the, the photographs were taken in August 1944 in crematorium five by a Greek Jew named Alex Herrera. They were smuggled out of Auschwitz by a woman named Helen, uh, Helena Danton in a toothpaste tube. Um, three days after taking these photographs, Alex was betrayed by another prisoner and beaten to death. Um, the first two photographs here, uh, you'll see, as you will see, have this black frame, which is, again, the inside of a gas chamber. But they, the, this frame is often cropped out, as in this example. And the second photograph, you see uh, the, Alex is receded farther into the gas chamber afraid of discovery, and um, this is the cropped version. Now, Nicholas Chair, uh, a, a Holocaust scholar, notes, I think quite correctly, that the black frame forms part of the noise of the photographs. He says, these images are edged by horror. The blackness is the boundary that permits the photograph to be. To remove this ambiguous edge is to avoid confronting the origin of the horrors portrayed in the pictures. And of course, the horrors and the origin is Auschwitz. How do you photograph Auschwitz? What is Auschwitz? The burning of the bodies is not Auschwitz. Uh, the mass of the black, the, the, the un, the, the, what can't be represented, what can't be conveyed is, is, is Auschwitz, if anything can be said to be Auschwitz. Um, this is why Yehiel Dinor, a survivor of Auschwitz, uh, pleaded with Gideon Hausner at the Eichmann trial, before the Eichmann trial, don't call me to the stand because I saw it all, but what I saw is not Auschwitz. What it is, I can't say. Auschwitz eludes all light. And indeed, the, the Zona Commando were known as the Geheimnisträger, the bearers of a secret, but it's a secret that eludes the, even the eye of the camera. Uh, in, the in the third photo, um, we have a photograph of Alex as he's running through what I would call a haunted wood. This is the, the woods near crematorium five where the Jews were forced to undress and, and prepare to go into the gas chamber. The bodies were being burned in the open pits because the crematoria could not handle at this time the load. Um, here in this image, you see the paradigm of a survivor who's desperate to deliver a message he can't deliver. He bears the burden of a word and an image in an attempt to somehow save the image and the word to retrieve it from a realm calculated to undo every word and every image. And this is the cropped version. You see the sky is cut out, the trees are cut out. So on. now finally, let me go in the minute or two I have to the fourth photograph. This is the one that's usually omitted. omitted. Um, why is it omitted? Because it's, we're told it doesn't show anything. It shows nothing. However, as George Didi Huberman says uh, in his book on these photographs, uh, his book, Images in Spite of All, he insists that to say it shows nothing quote, is to forget all that it tells us phenomenologically about the photographer, the impossibility of aiming the camera, the risk undergone, the urgency, the fact that he may have been running, the awkwardness, the sun in his eyes, perhaps the breathlessness too, says Didi Huberman. But I think it conveys even more than that. The, the truth of the fourth photograph for me, is not the truth of representation or evidence or anything that meets the eye. It's the truth of the non-representable. It's an image of the invisible, of what eludes. It's the Auschwitz that eludes everything that meets the eye. Uh, you can see it's made more of darkness than light. It has just enough light to show the grotesquely shaped darkness, the darkness of a mad desperation and a desperate madness. It's made of what was cropped from the other photographs, made of the darkness of the black mass and the immensity of the gray sky. It shows nothing, perhaps, but nevertheless, nevertheless, it shows nothingness. It's an image of Auschwitz in spite of all. Now, my last word, why, do, why is this omitted? Why do we turn away from this? My thinking is we're afraid of it. We're afraid, just as we're afraid of the black 
frame of the gas chamber. We crop it out. We cut it out. We cut out the fourth photograph altogether. And um, I think, in my view, since I just have a minute, um, the reasons for fleeing from it, it lies in the closing lines of a poem by W.H. Auden. The poem is called September 1st, 1939, where he writes, faces along the bar, cling to their average day. The lights must never go out. The music must always play. All the conventions conspire to make this fort assume the furniture of a home lest we should see where we are. Lost in a haunted wood, children afraid of the night who have never been happy or good. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Professor Patterson. Uh, we have one more contributor to our book who we shall be inviting very soon to speak to us about his chapter. But before we do so, I would like to invite Professor Mehnaz Afridi, Director of the Holocaust, Genocide and Interfaith Education Center and Professor of Religious Studies at Manhattan College, USA, to review our book very briefly. She has very kindly reviewed our book, which, and you would get to see that review in print very soon. May I also request Professor Patterson to kindly end his PowerPoint. Yes, okay. Th th thank you, Professor Patterson. <laughs> Professor Afridi, the you. floor is all yours. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, everyone. Um, some of you uh, I know uh, from actually inviting you to be a contributor to my own um, upcoming book called International Approaches to the Holocaust. But Navarro, thank you so much, and y'all, for doing this. It's a really wonderful book. I got to review it, not to write anything, so that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking from New York, and I work on the Holocaust and Islam. That's my field, and I'm trying to expand the field of Holocaust and genocide as much as I can. So this was a real fantastic book. I really commend all of you. Um, that are on this call and the ones that are listening. So I'm just going to read you some of the review and, and kind of stop and some of you are already presented um, in terms of um, your own um, kind of, I'm trying to get out of this view. Okay, your own um, work itself. So uh, I can't exit this for some reason. Hold on. Okay, now I'm exiting. So genocide and Holocaust studies is a vast and international field. However, it still needs to shift the European perspective and breadth in terms of geography and diverse scholars. And I ask the question, why? Because Holocaust and genocide studies is crucial in educating the future and simultaneously keeping the lessons of mass atrocities alive to stop racism, prejudice, and patterns that lead to murder. This co-edited book offers something rare for all scholars of mass violence and atrocities. It covers most continents and shifts the perspective from just Europe to other and equally crucial atrocities all over the world. The Holocaust is unprecedented as some scholars have noted, and this is why the expansion of the study to genocide war atrocity is time sensitive. This book hopes to change the landscape of how we think about mass violence, but especially in the context of memory, trauma, amnesia, and history. The contributors of the book are diverse with different academic backgrounds, which makes the volume a unique addition to genocide studies. The essays explore many aspects of mass violence, revisionism, reconstruction, atrocities, trauma, testimony, memorialization, and literature and most importantly, the issues within the fields of genocide and Holocaust education. The book offers interesting essays on the Holocaust and history in places like Mexico and South Africa that offer a new perspective and understanding of how non-European countries reacted to Jewish immigration and anti-Semitism. 
This can be seen in Daniela Glazer and Yael Simon's chapter, where they write poignantly that in April 1934, the Ministry of Interior circulated a confidential memorandum that prohibited the entry of Jews to Mexico. It sought to limit not only the immigration of Jews, but also of foreigners considered non assimilable to the Mexican population who were seen undesirable. But there were two important differences in relation to other groups listed in this document. Jewish immigration was characterized as the most undesirable of all, even though the Jews were those with the most need for refuge and growth. This code and essay stood out as a place where this book could be a book ended with this particular quote. And the issues of assimilation as Dennis Klein synthesizes in his chapter of violence and violations, betrayal and narratives of an atrocity of counts, that empirical and fact-finding narratives miss the point of testimony and witnessing. The book is educational and compartmentalized in sections for postgraduates who are interested in looking for Example, the South Asian context and the Bengali genocide of 1971, the Pinochet regime, or even the impact of propaganda and marginality in India and Turkey. Furthermore, there are specific and intimate nuances in essays like Sandra Commando, Photo 4, and the portrayal of the invisible by David Patterson, who illustrates through photos the non representable, non representable, because the images illustrate the truth that in Burkhanel, reality exceeded imagination. Putting these aspects of witnessing and thinking about a different context, such as Bangladesh, could highlight the similarities and the differences of genocide. Trauma, a big underlying theme for the chapters on Holocaust, mass atrocities in Bangladesh and South Africa. Raven Firestone provides analysis of Vamik Wolkan and how community trauma can be internalized and how violence can erupt many years later. The essays on marginality, like the Yazidis in Northern Iraq, illuminate the historical trauma that can be produced and present violence and atrocity against a minority group. But what these essays suggest is that this must be carried on through generations, but more importantly, different governments. I quote, the set of actions of actions aimed at uncovering the truth and producing memory about human rights, violations carried out on the initiative of civil society and the state have enabled a process of dealing with extreme trauma. However, this process, however, this process uh, due to its limitations and inadequacies has reached an impasse in which it is impossible to advance as a society in order to overcome this trauma. And this is from Nancy Lopiandia, who we heard of, uh, from today. The area that I might suggest needs some attention, and this is always maybe the case for us genocide and Holocaust scholars, is the important edited volume in the section Dialogue and Recon Reconciliation, where we are disappointed to read only one article, albeit a good one, by David Rosen. It would be worth adding more innovative and honest pieces like David Rosen's piece, but the volume falls a bit short on more scholars providing ways to heal and mend these issues. His work on religion and violence is essential and the reader would benefit by learning more about reconciliation and work in this volume. Finally, I commend you all that this book is crucial and has added value to the field of Holocaust and genocide studies that academia will benefit from, especially teaching these lessons to diverse audiences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Afridi, for your presentation and also for reviewing our, our book. We are all most grateful to you. Now, moving on, our last speaker for the day is Professor Dennis B. Klein. He is the director of the Jewish Studies Program and also that of the MA in Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program at Keene University, USA. He will be speaking to us about his chapter titled Violence and Violations, Betrayal Narratives in Atrocity Accounts. Professor Klein, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I very much appreciate the invitation and of course the company that I'm in. Uh, it's an extraordinary endeavor. I'm gonna share my screen or at least I'm certainly gonna try Put it that way. All right, very good.
Okay, very good. So I want to begin with this um, slide familiar to, I imagine, some of us on this Zoom conference. Um, it's uh, apparent to begin with the subject, as I indicated in the caption, um, is a moment of um, uh, desecration of the German soldiers forcing one Jewish man to cut the beard of another. But of course, the interest that I'm trying to draw our attention to here are the onlookers. And there are those um, in the uh, photo that are looking at the camera to the right and seem to be rather enjoying the moment. We see a mother with her infant child. Uh, there are others to the left that seem to also be enjoying this, et cetera, and so forth. The reason I'm focusing on this particular image is uh, reflects the work that I've been doing on survivor and victim testimonies. We've been hearing some of that uh, report uh, in this call. I'm certainly interested, as so many scholars have been, in the record that they have given us, that they've left behind. Uh, we call that bearing witness, and what they're bearing witness to is the subject of this volume, um, the um, phenomenon of mass violence. But I'm interested as well in what I refer to as counter-narratives. That is to say that there is expression in these memoirs to an expectation that their neighbors would have come to their assistance um, when they were in such considerable distress. And that those expectations that they have commented with such agony in their testimonies and memoirs, um, it was a, a sense of a great shock to them. They expected more, they received less. We can see again in this slide, right, that what was going through the minds, we can never know, but certainly aware that there are those surrounding them, individuals, folks that they might have once known, compatriots among them, um, it would if, or if nothing else, fellow human beings, and they received what they really had always hoped for and failed to achieve. And so um, we see that these expressions are based on an expectation that Jewish victims in particular had built up over centuries since the late 18th century, in which they had become part of the modern world. They were welcomed into it with conditions, but nonetheless, they expected, therefore, to have assimilated into or integrated as become part of their European culture. Um, and in fact, that didn't work out for them. Um, and the problem for them, therefore, is that their expectations were defeated. Um, that's the betrayal phenomenon that I'm so much interested in. Uh, in a word, that's what these survivors had expressed they expected more and received so much less. But what I also want to mention in this brief presentation as a summary of my chapter is that we find that in these same memoirs, a kind of lingering lived memory. That lived memory was the at least expectation that they were living among neighbors. And therefore we see in a memoir such as Simon uh, Wiesenthal's um, uh, well-known Sunflower memoir, his expressions of sympathy for, after all, an SS officer who was on his deathbed and asked or requested and compelled Wiesenthal then in the ghetto um, to uh, serve as his interlocutor. Sympathy for this dying man. Or Jean Amory, whose memoirs I have taken a look at as well, um, in which he expresses his memories deeply and with emotion of fellow feeling. I'm interested, therefore, in what is that lingering memory or lived memories um, that seems to also occupy their mental space. As they were writing, we get the sense that there is a, a, a longing or a yearning for fellow feeling, as Amory had expressed it, in spite of their defeated expectations. We know, therefore, that in the same memoir 
there's expression of um, bearing witness of the trauma or tragedy that they are providing evidence to those of us who read and listen to their testimonies. And yet there is this lingering memory, this longing or yearning to become part of humanity again. In other words, and here I'll conclude, there's tension in these memoirs, tension that is backward looking to the tragedy that they're bearing witness to and forward looking to the dream that someday they might again have an opportunity to live truly among their fellow human beings. And therefore, I'm going to challenge one of the presumptions of the volume, um, which is that there might well be um, hope for reconciliation. It's a term we hear about, and it's certainly something we should really explore. And again, I appreciate those who have explored the question and continue to do so. But when we listen to the victims, they don't talk about reconciliation. They know they can't expect it. They've been, yes, traumatized. They have been awakened to the reality that the neighbors they thought they once had were not truly their fellow human beings. And yet they're longing for something more. There is that dissonance. It's not reconciliation, it's dissonant. There's tension in these memoirs. And I'm really, in a sense, uh, grateful to the memoirists, to the survivors who share their stories, to be very honest with us and to really therefore help us conclude that if nothing else, it's maybe vigilance that is the message that they're really imparting to us rather than reconciliation. At least that's something for us to consider. So thank you for, the, for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Klein. Now, before I, we open the floor for questions, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my friend and dear colleague, Professor Yael Seaman for organizing this book launch event. I am immensely grateful to her and to her institution, Ibero-Americana University, which provided us the forum to have this book launch. Most grateful to the institution and also to all the organizing partners. Now the floor is open for questions. Uh, the panelists, as well as the audiences, are most welcome to ask questions. The, the audiences are invited to post their questions in the Q&A, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. Your question will be read out to whosoever it is addressed to and the panelists too are most welcome to ask questions should they have any. I do not see any questions in the Q&A as of now, but should uh, uh, Dr. Seaman have any question for any of the panelists or should any panelists yes. amongst us have, have any questions, please feel free to ask. Well, or I should have... you have any observations or any comments to make? Or should there be anything that you would like to add that you couldn't have the time to mention when you were presenting? Please do so now. This is the opportunity and we would be grateful. It would greatly enrich our discussion for the day. Navras, I will ask, first of all, thank you, Navras, for your kind words and, and thank you for inviting us to be part of this extraordinary volume. I was going to say something at the very end. Uh, I will keep my closing words for the, for the very end, but in the meantime, I, I was thinking, Navras, about the title of the book, and I was wondering whether, uh, because also of the question that was posted yesterday about the use of the categories, Holocaust, genocide, human rights, so uh, to what extent, first of all, why did you choose to, to, to entitle it Mass Violence? And, I think the words genocide and Holocaust have been mentioned even more uh, today uh, than mass violence. And uh, whether you think that by in, um, choosing this category, on the one hand, you em embrace uh, everybody so we can uh, sort of uh, can participate, con have a conversation, even if we're looking at very different cases, but whether you think we run the risk of perhaps diluting the specificity of 
uh, different types of violence because not every violence is uh, the same of the same kind. No? So what do you think about that? I'm, I, you said we might ask you ask each other questions, so I'm asking you that. After the Holocaust, for quite some time, there was this hesitation about comparing the Holocaust with other genocides. But uh, Professor Yehuda Boyer helped us overcome that hesitation. And he said that comparing the Holocaust only enables us to realize even more the exclusivity of the Holocaust, how different it was from the other genocides. Holocaust, still remains as the main point of reference for us when we talk of mass violence, because it is a genocide that is still unmatched in scale and magnitude by any other genocide. In fact, after the Holocaust, we raised the slogan of never again. But unfortunately, that slogan has proved to be hollow. We have had so many episodes of mass violence since then. There were a number of reasons as to why I developed an interest in uh, the subject of mass violence studies. I can speak only for myself, not for my co-editor, Priya Singh. She would have other reasons as to how she developed an interest in the field of genocide studies and mass violence studies. I come from India. India has never experienced any genocide, but it has experienced mass violence, terrible mass violence at the time of its partition. That violence was not genocide, though the violence was genocidal in nature, but not genocide. It does not fulfill the, 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 the criteria that are required for any episode of mass violence to qualify as genocide. There were, the number of people who died during the partition violence is estimated to be 2 million. 10 million people became homeless. Yet I see, in spite of that, I see that there is no memorial in India or in any of the other two states that came into existence out of former British India, that is Pakistan and Bangladesh, devoted to the victims of that terrible mass violence. So there has been a tendency to not speak about it, which is sad, because unless and until we confront these, uh, this harsh past of ours, we can never make efforts for the betterment of our future. And in spite of that, as I pointed out also in my presentation, the state's record in preventing mass violence and bringing the guilty to justice has been dismal. The rate of conviction in cases of mass violence in India is less than 1%. So, I feel India needs Holocaust education more than anything else right now, because after all, continuity of life is more important than anything else. And we can ensure that only if we draw lessons from what has happened in the past. This is true for other countries uh, of the world as well. It is for this reason only that we have Holocaust education in countries such as USA and Australia, countries that were not directly affected by the Holocaust. So we learn things only by putting things into perspective and we better con we cont contextualize things better if we have a global overview. So it is certainly uh, advisable to study the Holocaust along with other genocides. Thank you. Thank you, Navras. I would also like my fellow panelists to comment on this. Jael, can I, can I ask a question? Yes, um, uh, I would like to ask to Professor David Patterson uh, about uh, his presentation. I found it very, very interesting. And uh, my question if is, do you think it's possible to study this, uh, analyze these uh, pictures confronting with uh, perhaps other fragments uh, in other uh, representation of uh, Sonder Commandos or the, uh, the concentration on death camps to perhaps guess a, a big picture because 
uh, I guess that when you don't have uh, the sources that they speak about, you can you have to guess, and the interpretation is a lot of guessing. Um, and I suppose that there are fragments of uh, what happened to Sonder Commandos in uh, testimonies, uh, memories, uh, I don't know. So what do you think about that? Yes, well, there, we have only fragments. There are <clears throat> the five diaries, <clears throat> five diaries kept by Zondo Commando members that were unearthed in the 1960s, uh, which again are just fragments. We have a couple of uh, the memoirs, uh, Philip Mueller is a famous one, Auschwitz Inferno, his memoir. Uh, he was on the last Zondo Commando, the only Zonda Commando survivors were, were the ones on the last one at the time of the uprising in Bear Canal on October 7th, 1944. But um, you know, the question is, you know, as Yechiel Dinor, a famous survivor, the, he goes by the name Katsetnik as an author. Uh, he said, I, I was there, I saw the gassing, the burning, the beating, the starvation, but that isn't Auschwitz. What it is, I can't say. Um, I think Auschwitz uh, is by definition non-representable. Mm -hmm. Auschwitz is, I, I would say, is, is mass violence, not just against humanity, but uh, against the holiness of the human created in the image and likeness of the Holy One. It's an assault on the testimonies the millennial testimony of the Jewish people, people to the creator who creates each human being as holy and, and, and infinitely precious. How do you portray the infinite? In other words, Auschwitz as an assault on the invisible is an assault on the infinite. So all you can do is, uh, it's like Moses trying to see God's face. God says, you can only see my back, but not my face. We can only see the back of Auschwitz in a, you know, to, to invert that. Uh, we can't look, to look into the face is like looking into the face of a Medusa. Uh, it's, it eludes us, it, it paralyzes us to the extent that we glimpse it. Uh, those of us who engage the testimonies, the photographs, um, those who I love Dennis Klein's presentation about the absence of the neighbor, um, it's traumatizing, you know, for those of us who, who, who try to approach it. So yes, uh, I appreciate the, <laughs> Nancy, I'm, I'm not answering your question very well, but there's, it's like grabbing at, at a fleeting shadow. Um, it's, uh, we, all we can do is put together the pieces of a puzzle in which most of the pieces are missing. Um, we can listen, we can try to understand, but there time, comes a time, as Elie Wiesel says, when we, when we must lower our eyes and not understand. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Navras, uh, thank you, Professor Patterson, and thank you, Nancy. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Ida Lichter asks, how do we come to an, or, an understanding of the motivations and emotions of the perpetrators of mass violence slash uh, genocide? I don't know if anyone wants to, to answer this difficult question. Yes, Navras. I can speak more confidently about India than about any other place in the world. In India, it has been proved by a number of studies that there are direct benefits to be drawn from the perpetration of mass violence, or even if not mob, mob, mass violence, but certainly mob violence. And a sad reality of India is that mob violence is has become cyclic in nature, and it is intertwined with India's politics. Every now and then there is an election going on in India of some level, 
either parliamentary election or state assembly election or municipal election. And whenever there is an election, there is perpetration of more, more violence in the, in the area because it immensely helps in polarizing the voters. So this is the direct benefit that politicians draw from mob violence. Another thing is that it is generally projected as spontaneous, a sudden outburst, of fury and anger, which is certainly not the case. Whenever violence takes place, it is always orchestrated, premeditated, and pre-planned. Unfortunately, there have also been instances in India when uh, politicians, in, instead of condemning uh, the, those episodes of violence, though that perpetration of violence, have gone on to condone violence and to kind of justify it. So this has also happened. So you see, much has already been written about the motivation for perpetration of mass violence. It can vary from one place to another, but political dividends, political benefits, certainly figures large. It, it immensely helps in uh, scapegoating a certain section of society for blaming it for all the, the problems that that particular society faces. And there is always a higher chance of perpetration of mass violence when the, con the conditions are bad, when the, 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 the state is facing problems, economic problems, or, is, or any other issues that it finds itself unable to deal with. So it helps in distracting uh, people uh, from it, deviating, uh, uh, diverting attention. I don't know if I was able to competently answer this question, but I would also request our fellow panelists to respond to it. To it. I can uh, refer you to a very good book on this very question. Uh, the book is called Into That Darkness by Gita Sereni, S-E-R-E-N-Y. And it's, it's a study of Franz Stangl, the commandant of Treblinka. And Gita Sereni, uh, you know, studied him, uh, interviewed his family, met with him in South America where he fled, and uh, was trying to get at what is what is this heart beating in this man? What is this? What are the thoughts going through his mind? And uh, she, I don't. She never really got a good answer, but she spends a lot of pages exploring this difficult question. You know, how do you spend your day gassing and burning people and go home, have a cognac, put on Mozart and open up Goethe? Uh, this is a problem and it implicates all of us as you know, part of Western civilization, I think. But anyway, Into That Darkness by Gita Sereni is, a, is, is one place to look. I was just gonna add to what David just had said. Of course, this is a difficult, maybe impossible question to answer, but um, I think of the quote by George Steiner, uh, similar to what David had just mentioned, of uh, listening to Schubert at night and killing in the morning. Um, it, there's, there is, either you know, Robert J. Lifton's kind of divided consciousness, or there is synchrony in the way they understood those, what seems to you and me uh, discrepant ideas. And I believe there is synchrony. They believe they were doing the right thing. They didn't regard their victims as humans to begin with. And they thought that they were actually achieving uh, the resurrection of Germany and of the Aryan culture that they wanted to preserve and protect. So I, I believe they were uh, doing the right thing. It's so difficult and really impossible for us to imagine that. But, you know, I've recently um, reviewed with my students images of lynching in the South, in which, right, we see those horrible images. But we also need to note, as I did in my first slide, in my one slide, uh, we also need to note that there were those surrounding uh, the um, 
moment of destruction with glee, uh, jubilation, triumph, accomplishment. Um, those who perpetrate, right, are not, uh, they don't consider themselves doing what we would consider them to violate canons of, of human behavior. On the contrary, I really think that they were, right, quite impressed with their accomplishments. Um, I will, I will right. add something very, very little about Chile, and I think in the case of Chile, the key was deshumanizing the uh, people from the left that were against Pinochet, and deshumanizing them, uh, they were not a problem to, to kill them or torture or whatever, and uh, that was very linked to ideology, the uh, national security doctrine, that was uh, the military learned from the states and uh, against Marxism in a, a scenario of a Cold War. So for them was correct, they were saving the country from Marxist government, uh, Allende, the, through the country between 1970, 1973. So they were really good people, saved the country from Marxism. So I think dehumanizing is a is a key element. Sorry, Daniela. Um, I think uh, good, not right. You you wanted yes, to say um, something. Yes. Just to add on top of what has already been said. Um, so I think it's important to make a distinction uh, between the motivations of of leaders, political leaders, and then uh, the um, perpetrators, the locals, you know, the neighbors who turn against their neighbors and engage in killing uh, because it can be different. Um, and just to mention a few of the things the literature, you know, tell us about uh, those factors, you know, greed has been uh, proposed, um, ideology, as Nancy mentioned, especially dehumanizing the other, um, you know, um, considering the other as less than a human, a threat, or even sometimes parasite uh, to the well-being of, of the community. Um, um, looting, religious prejudice, uh, resentments um, were all things that had been um, proposed in the literature. Um, and in terms of the methodology of studying that question, you know, what is the motivation of, of a perpetrator? It is obviously very challenging to interview the perpetrator uh, themselves. Uh, so, uh, like, for example, in our case, uh, we uh, understand the motivations of IS fighters uh, from their magazine, for example, where they clearly state how they perceive Yazidism, the religion, and how they think that um, it's a group that must be exterminated. Um, they're apostates who need to be killed or con um, forced to converse to Islam. Um, so th these kind of secondary sources can be helpful, you know, looking at narratives, legal testimonies uh, of survivors um, and memories, et cetera. So, uh, but uh, it is something that varies across different genocides and different cases of mass violence. Thank you. I think Daniela now wants to say something. <laughs> very short. I mean, I think we are very concerned in trying to return the victims, their voice, their agency, their experiences, trying to put the victims of the center of our research. And I think it could be some resistance from our part to try to understand the perpetrators. I, I think it's not an easy thing to do and, and that to understand them, you have to put you, yourself in their shoes and try to understand how, how did they feel and how it, did they think? And, and I don't know if it's something that we want to do or, or I want to do. So I think it's very difficult. And I think there, there, are, there is a lot of personal resistance to, to approach them and try to understand them and get involved and dedicate a lot of, of time to try to, to, to understand them. So I think it's also a methodological limit from our part to, to try to understand and there are not a lot of historiography on that also that's it thank you daniela i i would only add that at ibero we have a scholar who who has done extensive research on perpetrators in the guatemalan genocide and he had to look at the holocaust literature in order to find some uh, some reference right to ex examine 
the questions that he wanted to examine. And like you all said, there are singularities to the Guatemalan case, but there are also similarities with other, other genocides. So uh, thank you all, uh, Nabras. I don't know if we should uh, close the event. Do you want to say anything else? Yes, I would also like to thank, most very importantly, all the people, all the eminent scholars who contributed to this volume. I'm, I can say that I'm still in the state of infancy when it comes to the field of genocide studies, yet scholars of the stature of those present here with us right now agreed to contribute to our volume. So I just can't thank, thank them enough for it. Most grateful to each one of the contributors to the volume. Thank you very much. So in, in order to, to finish, if I may, Navras, I, on behalf of the Department of Social and Political Science at Iberoamericana University, Mexico City, I would like to thank the panelists for their extraordinary presentations. I, I would also like to, sorry, express my appreciation to the participants. We are very honored to be part of this uh, co-edited volume. Thank you, Navras. Thank you, Priya. And I would like uh, to thank our partners to this event, the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies at UT Dallas, Asia in Global Affairs, the Department of Hebrew, Biblical and Jewish Studies at the University of Sydney, Australia, the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Program at Keene University, Salzburg Global Seminar, and Bengal State University. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, this is, a, I, like we've said before, a truly global effort that brings together a community of scholars with very different expertise and perspectives. But I think we all share a true worry about mass violence, past and present. I would also like to say, even though we have a, a small number of participants, that if you're interested in buying the book, <laughs> I was doing an advertise, uh, advertisement yesterday. I will do it again. I realized that Rutledge has a 20% off, it's a back to school <laughs> a discount. So I will actually post the link in the chat so everybody can see it. And it would be great if our institutions uh, acquire the, the book for their collections. So thank you, thank you, thank you, muchísimas gracias. And we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Navras, you. let me take a photo of you like that. Please hold the book again. <laughs> but but I see Nancy and not you. I don't know why. Let's let's see. Maybe if you speak, you will come to the main screen, Navras. I don't know. Did you take a photo, Daniela? Or? Can you can you see me Daniela now? Did. Yes. Now wait a second. Yes. <laughs> yes. You post photos of all of us. Now let's post a photo of you. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Good morning, Navrat. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>